Pastor Dan Wait, Pastor, please preach the word. Please take your Bibles and turn to Titus, Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Beginning with verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Father, we ask that the preaching of the word this evening we glorify thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. When studying, uh, preparing for the message here, I was, uh, a few weeks back, I was teaching a class in the book of Genesis. And as I were, we were studying through Genesis chapter 6, we came across the account of, of Noah. And in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible reminds us uh, something uh, that, that happened in Noah's life that's very interesting at the time. But in Genesis 6, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, a perfect in all his generations, and Noah walked with God. Noah found grace in God's eyes. Noah walked with God, just like Enoch had walked with God before him, and perhaps some other godly men in the past, prior to the flood. And when we think about what grace is, what God's grace can do for us, we know that Noah found the grace in God's eyes. And the passage here in Titus chapter 2 reminds us about grace. Now the title of the sermon this evening is Adorning Doctrine. Now when we think about adorning something, we put on something. Now the the, the adorning doctrine, that, that thought comes from the previous verse. In verse 11, uh, Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Adorning the doctrine of God. How is one to adorn doctrine? A doctrine is very, very, sometimes technical information that's based upon Scripture. But yet that doesn't mean it should be ignored. There's all sorts of doctrines. We break them down into ten major categories. Theology proper, Christology, Bibliology, Pneumatology, and we can list all of them if you want to. There's all sorts of doctrine, and they can be categorized. They can be studied in different parts. But we are to adorn doctrine. To put it on, to wear it, to be able to have it be a part of us. Be part of us. Not just be something in the abstract, but doctrine needs to be a part of us. Good, sound, biblical doctrine needs to be a part of us just as though, just like anything else is a part of us. We have to make it a part of us. And the scripture says, and and we'll see in this passage, there are some things um, uh, that will teach us, there are things we'll have to live by, there are things we have to look for, and the things we have to give. But the scripture says, teaching us for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Now, grace in, the grace in and of itself is a doctrine. It's a, it's a very important doctrine, a fundamental doctrine of Scripture. It comes under the category of soteriology. That's the doctrine of salvation. God's grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. How else can salvation be brought other than the grace of God? There are people today, there are movements, there are religions, there are teachings... They try to teach something contrary to that. They teach a salvation by works, a salvation by 
being nice to people. They mingle law and grace. But salvation is only by grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. When we think about this, think about Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God delivered Noah and his family. His wife, his three sons, and his three daughters-in-law. They were delivered. Because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we, today, if we're born again Christians, we've been delivered by the grace of God. It bringeth salvation to all men. And if we in the previous verses, Titus here is the pastor of, uh, in the church in, in, in Crete. And there's, there, are, there are like five categories. We have the, uh, the aged men in verse 2. Aged women in verse 3. The young men in verse 6. The young women in verse 4. The servants in verse 9. And this is the classification, the grace of God has appeared to all men. All these categories of men and women, the grace of God has appeared to. There's no, it doesn't exclude anybody. God's grace does not exclude anyone. And the first time the word grace appears in the New, 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 pardon me, in the Old Testament was that passage there in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 6. And you know that Noah was born about 1,000 years, 1,056 years after creation. The flood took place another 600 years after that. But Noah found grace. And grace, grace is not only spoken of of Noah, it's spoken of of a lot of people in the Old Testament. A lot of things, a lot of concepts, a lot of doctrinal terminology in the New Testament. But when we think of what grace is, there's all sorts of definitions of grace, and we'll get to them a little bit in a little bit. Unmerited favor, different different terms like that, God's riches at Christ's expense. All these different Definitions of this doctrinal word grace. The word grace is used of Lot. Uh, Lot in Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19 verses um, 18 to 20. If you look there briefly, it's, it's talked a uh, lot. Uh, although we sometimes can't figure out Lot at times. But grace in Genesis chapter 19 verses 18 and 20. The Bible tells us Genesis 19 18 to 20 And Lot said unto them Oh, not so, my Lord Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight and thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil take me, and I die. So Lot's life was, was saved, was spared, and right in contrast with grace, in that verse there in Genesis 19, we have the word mercy. One aspect of, uh, this is another doctrinal word, of course, we want to adorn doctrine. You know, grace is receiving something we do not deserve. Mercy is, is not receiving something we do deserve. So Lot was a recipient of grace. Laban also talks about receiving grace in Genesis chapter 30, verse 27. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. The idea of being blessed. God Jehovah God had blessed Laban, had given Laban grace for the sake of Jacob. The term is used with Jacob and Esau. In Genesis 32, verse 5, in Genesis 33, verse 8, in Genesis 33, verse 10, in Genesis 33, verse 15, of Shechem, with Jacob and Dinah's brothers, the word grace is used. And the idea of grace, the doctrinal concept of grace is receiving something that is not deserved. In a a deep theological, in in a simple sense, not that God's grace can be simple because we can't comprehend it, we are receiving 
Christ's righteousness because of the death of Christ upon the cross. See, Adam's sin caused death to pass upon all mankind. And it's because of the grace of God that we do not have to stand in the sin of Adam, but we can be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Grace is used of Joseph and Potiphar in Genesis chapter 39, verses 3 and 4. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. And Joseph found grace in his sight and served him. And he made him overseer over the ha his house and all that he had he put in his hand. That's Genesis 39. See, this is grace on a human level. We're illustrating here. But God has given us grace on a godly level. Far more than a human level. We as human beings could be gracious and demonstrate grace to others. But God, ultimately, His grace, the grace of God, God has appeared to all men. It's there. We know it by reason and by revelation. We can see God's creative act, creative power, creative existence by just looking at creation. And the Word of God reveals to us more details about God's salvation. We can look at creation and know there is a God. We can look at the Scripture and know there is a Savior. A Savior that has died for us because of God's grace. Grace is used of of Jacob with Joseph, of Joseph with Pharaoh, of the nation of Israel with the Egyptians. It's used of Moses, uh, Moses and the children of Israel. All these different places throughout the Old Testament we have illustrations of God's grace being used. God is a gracious, gracious God. He's also a merciful, merciful God. As far as with Ruth and with Boaz, in Ruth chapter 2, verse 2, And Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Again, in the, in the book of Ruth, in Ruth chapter 2, verses 10 to 13, we're reminded, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, We have... Why have I found grace in thine eyes? Thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. And Boaz answered and said unto her, And if it fully show me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since, since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and are come unto the, a people which thou knowest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, for thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. Here Ruth, she understands that Boaz is demonstrating to her grace a woman from the land of Midi, from the land of Moab, a country that was an alien country to Israel. She came to back to Bethlehem, Judah, with her mother-in-law Naomi, because she cared for her mother-in-law Naomi. Naomi came to the land of Moab with her husband and her two sons, and yet. When she was there, her husband died and her two sons died. And Ruth, her daughter-in-law, came with her, returned with her to Bethlehem, Judah, to the nation of Israel. And God providentially allowed her to find grace in the eyes of Boaz. And eventually Boaz was not the nearest of kin to Naomi, but the nearest of kin refused to, to fulfill the obligation of the kinsman redeemer 
And so Boaz fulfilled that responsibility. And through the line of Boaz and through the line of Ruth, we have the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, being born. Is we have the son of Boaz, the son of Ruth, Solomon, which was the son of Jesse, which was the son of David, king of Israel. And so God's grace, an unmerited favor, something that is not deserved, we see demonstrated, illustrated on a human level here with Ruth and Boaz. Also, we see the word grace being used with Hannah and Eli. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 17 to 19. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way, and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanai knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. The word grace is used in the context of Saul and Jesse, with David and Jonathan, with Esther and Hazarus. These are elements of grace on a human level, where we have grace being demonstrated by people that are interacting with other people that have no reason other than the providence of God to be gracious to one another. When we think about the doctrine of grace, in Romans chapter 3, verses uh, 21 to 24, and again, the book of Romans is filled with doctrine, uh, as other parts of scripture, scripture is, is filled with doctrine. All throughout the Bible, we have doctrine, and we have to look for doctrine to understand what the teaching of Scripture is. But in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 21 to 24, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ and to all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, we as born-again Christians have been justified freely by God's grace. Notice the word freely. Justified is, is, a, is another doctrinal word. It's, it's, a, it's a act of God, a legal act of God, whereby a sinner is declared righteous. And notice the Bible says, being justified freely by his grace. God has declared us righteous because he's gracious by his grace. We do not deserve to be justified by his grace. But he does so because it's part of his character. Because he's been satisfied by the work of Christ on the cross. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we have another aspect of grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we could look at verses 1 to, from 1 to 9, but let's look at verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is making us rich. He became poor so we could become rich. The grace of God that bringeth salvation that appeared to all men. And again in Ephesians, we look at the richnesses, riches, the wealth of God in his grace, and the wealth of God in his mercy. Again, mercy is withholding something that is deserved. A punishment that's been deserved. And God in Ephesians chapter 2 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, 
and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God's grace is mentioned in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. And again, the grace of God on, a, on his level is much greater than the grace on a, on a human level. Not by works of righteousness which we, are, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And another passage that talks about God's grace is in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Grace is unmerited favor. As we were mentioning before, some have said God, some have defined it as a simple definition, as God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is the receipt of something that is not deserved, in contrast with mercy, which is, which is not receiving something that is deserved. God's grace is what brings salvation to us. And when we're supposed to, when we're to adorn doctrine, we have, think of this verse in the book of Titus, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. It's appeared to all of us. It brings us salvation. We cannot be saved or delivered without God's grace. And as we said before, the, cat, the, the category of all men in this verse, it's appeared to all men. All men. All men, all women, all children. And what does it do? What does God's grace do for us? We know the grace of God. We, we looked at some brief scripture passages that help us explain what God's grace is. We explained a few definitions of what God's grace is. For the grace of God that brings salvation to appeared to all men, teaching us, God's grace can teach us. What does it teach us? It teaches us many things here in the passage. Three things. Teaching us that denying ungodliness. God's grace should assist us in understanding about what is godliness and what is ungodliness. In the passage in Romans, Romans chapter 7, uh, we know that the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church of Rome, says in, in uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, 
For I not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Grace will tell us, will explain to us, teaching us to deny ungodliness. This is what he teaches us. Ungodliness is based, is a form, and is a form of wickedness, a form of sin. It's everything that's contrary to what God expects us to do. And we are to deny it. We are to deny ungodliness. The ungodliness we're to deny. God wants us to deny it. And this is what his grace will teach us. We look at God's grace, what God has done for us, and the scripture says, teaching us that deny ungodliness. We are to deny ungodliness. One other thing we're to not deny, we're to deny worldly lusts. Worldly lusts. The scripture says, worldly lust. We think of what the world does. What the world has, how the world influences us. How the world influences others in the world. And how it seems as though the corruption of the world is getting worse and worse. Although, we're not sure how worse it was in Noah's day. But still, God's grace should be a very important denominator, a very important factor in our life. Not only our the grace that has saved us, but the grace that can sanctify us. The grace that can cause us to grow, that cause us to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. It teaches us to deny ungodliness. It teaches us to deny worldly lusts. And it teaches us how we're to live. There are certain things God's grace will tell us to deny. And there are certain things that God's grace will tell us to embrace. A way to live. We're to live soberly. We're to be controlled, not by your own desires, your own will, but we were controlled by God the Holy Spirit, righteously, doing things that are in accordance to what the Scripture says. The Word of God is your ultimate standard of what righteousness is. We look into the Word of God if we have a question, whether something is righteous or unrighteous, and it will give us the answer. And the passage also says we're to live godly. Because we are, we are people who are part of this earth. We are part of the world. We're to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We have a difficult time sometimes having the victory of living soberly, righteously, and godly. But if we reflect upon God's grace, because we know it's appeared to all men, we know that it can teach us that to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, we are to live these three ways, the soberly, the righteously, and godly. Noah, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, the scripture reminds us that he was a preacher of righteousness. The Bible says, And spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood, of, flood upon the world of the ungodly. God doesn't like ungodliness. He doesn't like the ungodliness of the world, and he doesn't like ungodliness, the carnality of, of Christians. And so when we have this foundation, we have the grace of God, for the grace of God that brings salvation to the pure to all men, teaching us that the night ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And why do we want to, why do we want to live soberly, righteously, and godly? Because there is something that's after this world. This world is not where it stops. There are people that believe that this life is all they have. But that's not true. That's not biblical. That's false doctrine. Because the scripture says... In verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This demonstrates the deity of Jesus Christ. Then in this verse, 
the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I think we equate those two titles, the great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, together and unite them. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is God. He is God. And when we have looking for the blessed hope, now some we want could divide this into two sections. We have the blessed hope and we have the glorious appearing. The blessed hope is when Christ meets his church in the air. And the glorious appearing is when the saints who have been raptured return with Christ to the earth after the tribulation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, we're talking about the blessed hope, about the rapture of the church. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the tr last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is the blessed hope that we look to, because of the grace of God, we can have hope in the rapture of the believer, of those of our dear friends and loved ones who have died before us, and perhaps the opportunity for us to be caught up with them in the air. Another aspect, another verse, passage that talks about the blessed hope is in First Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the blessed hope. Because we can look for the blessed hope, looking for the blessed hope, and the glorious appearing. If you remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, and following verses 6 to 11, when the apostles were there on the Mount of Olives, the, 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 the question was asked of the men of Israel, why stand you gazing up to heaven? And the answer was, you know, this same Jesus, which was taken up, um, he's going to return the same way. Acts chapter 1 tells us that. He's going to return back right to the Mount of Olives. This is the glorious appearing. His physical return to the physical earth. One of them, he returns to the atmosphere of the earth in the rapture. And the other one, he physically comes down and touches down on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah chapter 14 tells us that. Look at, the, look at Zechariah 14. Think about that. How God, in Zechariah 14, Zechariah 14 verses 1 to 9. Behold, the day of the Lord shall come and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is beside Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, and the east and toward the west, 
and there shall be a valley, great, a great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north, and half toward the south. The Lord Jesus Christ, here, as Zechariah mentions, is Jehovah. He's going to return to the Mount of Olives, the glory superior. First Thessalonians 5, Matthew 24 talks about the thief. The thief is coming not to... These are things about the glory superior. The blessed hope, the rapture, the glory superior. We can look for the blessed hope. We can look for the glory superior because of God's grace. It brings salvation to us. We're saved, born again, washed in the blood of Christ. And God wants us to live a sanctified and holy, holy life. That's why we're to deny. It's so teaching us. That's why God's grace needs to teach us to deny an ungodliness and word of us how we are to live. To live soberly, righteously, and godly. And what we are to look for. The blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. And what did our great God and Savior do for us? Verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us. He gave himself for us. Why? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ, why did the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, why did he give himself for us? Because the Bible says in this passage, the doctrine of redemption, that he might redeem He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. All iniquity. To buy us back. He's buying us back, number one. Then he's purifying us. And we are to be reserved and sanctified and set apart for him. He's purifying to us a peculiar people. God, that's what God expects of us. Because of God's grace, this is what we can do. We can live him, we can live for him, serve for him, we can live soberly, we can live righteously, we can live godly, and we can look for the blessed hope. He gave himself for us. He redeemed us from all iniquity. And this is not some iniquity. The redemption of Christ is complete. It's not partial, it's not limited, it is complete. He redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And then Titus is admonished. And we, by application, are admonished as well. If we're going to be adorning doctrine, we need to be also teaching doctrine in our different spheres of influence. These things teach, do these things speak, which is, which is a, and exhort and rebuke with all authority. See, the, the authority we have doesn't come from ourselves. The authority we have comes from the Word of God. So every doctrine we believe is based upon the Word of God. And the final phrase of this verse is, let no man, let no man despise thee. So when we think about the passage tonight, when we think about God's grace, when we think about adorning the doctrine of God, let's consider, fundamentally, we've all been saved by grace. The forensic Catholic of God, whereby he's declared the sinner righteous, we've been justified. God has justified us because of his grace, based upon the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. The empty tomb that is present. Redemption has come to us. God has given that to us. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation that appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that 
he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of all good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Father, we ask that thou would allow us to speak these things with all authority, with all doctrine, that thou would allow us to look for that blessed hope, that thou would allow us to put off worldly lusts and ungodliness so we could live soberly and righteously and godly. We ask this in thy Son's name, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on our behalf. Amen.